This shows a slate for Cries and Whispers, which was shot from September 9, 1971, until October 30 of that year. It was a production of Bergman's company Cinematograph. It says there that it's based on the island of Fura, but in fact the offices were in Stockholm. Fura was a sparsely populated island in the Baltic, where Bergman had made his principal home since the 1960s. He'd established Cinematograph as a production entity intended to help young and offbeat directors, as well as producing his own work. The film was shot entirely on location, at this manor about 35 miles south of Stockholm on the edge of Lake Malloran. Here the young Strindberg had spent his summers as a boy and took the inspiration for the character of Miss Julie from the elegant lady of the manor at that time. Bergman himself always acknowledged the debt he owed to Strindberg, even if he never adapted his plays for the cinema, but his stage productions of the Strindberg classics are legendary in Swedish theatre history. The Swedish Film Institute had just built some new studios on the fringe of Stockholm City at enormous expense. Harry Schein, director of the Institute, was upset that Bergman didn't want to make Cries and Whispers in these state-of-the-art studios. In fact, Cries and Whispers is unusual in Bergman's later work in that it was filmed entirely on location. The manor of Texinger Nesby was surrounded by parkland, and Bergman would use both the interior of the mansion as well as the leafy exteriors. When Bergman and his crew arrived, the manor was in a state of disarray, and so he was free to decorate and adjust the interior as he needed. The lighting is so crucial in Cries and Whispers, and it's always more difficult to light a private home than it is to light a studio set where you have all the arc lights and other facilities at hand. Sven Nikvist and Bergman arrived at the manor some three weeks in advance of principal photography, so that they could consider in peace and quiet how to shoot the picture. This was Sven Nikvist's 14th film with Bergman, and he'd been experimenting with colour since 1963 when they shot the comedy All These Women. The lighting on Cries and Whispers was rendered more complex by Bergman's insistence on red, or specifically crimson, as the principal colour. As Bergman said at the time, in his dreams, red represents the interior of the soul, a kind of membrane suffused with blood. When I was a child, wrote Bergman, I saw the soul as a shadowy dragon, blue as smoke, hovering like an enormous winged creature, half bird, half fish, but inside the dragon everything was red. Here the walls were repainted and recovered completely, along with every detail of the existing rooms, so that they would fit into the period of the film, which is the very end of the 19th century. Ingmar and I tested everything that could be tested in advance, indoors and out, recalled Nickfist. Furniture and wallpaper, costumes and makeup. Makeup was especially important because of all the red. The light on the faces of the actors could easily get too harsh. Bergman's films have never been popular in Sweden, with the exception of The Silence, because of the sex scenes, of course, and Fanny and Alexander, his swan song, as far as the big screen was concerned, which did meet with the approval of the public. But generally, his films were not as appreciated at home as they were around the world. And that led to difficulties for Bergman at the end of the 1960s. The Hour of the Wolf... Shame, The Passion of Anna, were financed to a larger extent by the one million dollars that United Artists had paid to Svensk film industry for Persona and Bergman's ensuing film, which would be Hour of the Wolf. But none of the four releases would strike gold at the box office. Bergman even accepted an offer from ABC Pictures to make his first feature in English, which turned out to be The Touch and another flop. So when it came to setting up Cries and Whispers in the aftermath of The Touch, Bergman found that, with the exception of the Swedish Film Institute, nobody really wants to back it. And so long before the internet and the concept of crowdfunding existed, he asked each of his leading actors, along with Sven Ekvist, the cinematographer, if they would work for no salary up front in exchange for shares in the picture's eventual profits. Which they did, because they were very loyal to Bergman and they believed in him. Despite its very bleak content, the film actually went on to be very successful and indeed made well over $1 million profit on its release in the US, for example. 
This is the press conference at which Bergman announced the budget situation and also introduced his actors. On the wall in the background, we see some of the costume designs by Marek Vos and Greta Johansson. Bergman liked to hold a press conference of this kind. I attended one that he gave for his stage production of Wojciech in 1969. Cries and whispers needed to be explained because of its unusual financing structure. Bergman didn't much like journalists coming onto his sets, and so the press conference became the traditional forum for questions. There's Marik Vos on the left, who worked on only a few of Bergman's films, but left her mark on each and every one. As early as 1961, she was nominated for an Academy Award for her work on Bergman's The Virgin Spring, and would finally win an Oscar in the spring of 84 for the costumes she designed for Fanny and Alexander. On Cries and Whispers, she was production designer. Bergman's relationship with the Swedish press was pretty good on the whole. It's a small country, and if you don't have the press on your side, you can have a lot of problems, especially as a filmmaker. There were occasional critics with whom Bergman fell out, but in general, he was held in high respect. Because although his films were not hits at the box office, his stage productions were almost always a triumph. Lee Fulman to his left, flanked by Ingrid Tulin and then Carrie Silwan. Carrie Silwan was making her debut in the film as the nurse named Apley Maria, and there's Harriet Anderson next to the window. The nurse was a role, incidentally, that Bergman envisaged for Mia Farrow, but she did not, in fact, become a part of the cast long before her collaboration with Woody Allen. Bergman could always turn on the charm on such occasions. Laughing and chatting with the journalists, addressing them by their first name, and so on. His mood here also shows how relaxed and confident he was about making cries and whispers. The press conference was held in the new Swedish Film Institute building, and through the window you'll see the large area of parkland on the outskirts of Stockholm. The footage we're seeing seems to have been assembled in chronological order, with the preparations out at the manor house preceding the formal press conference. So very early in the shoot, poor Harriet had to stage her deathbed scene. With her sisters, played by Ingrid Tulina Lee Vullman, and the nurse, played by Kari Sulman, all dutifully attired in black. The colours seem to fight for dominance throughout the film, white for purity, as it were, black for death, crimson for the soul, and autumnal yellow for forgiveness. This is a priest, played by a very old friend of Bergman's, Anders Eck. You may recall his haranguing the crowd of flagellants in the seventh seal. The priest comes to say some words over the deathbed, so Harriet has to play dead, which is done, as we'll see, with a great deal of good humour. Harriet was always ready for a laugh to defuse the situation. There's Sven Nykvist giving instructions to his assistants. On the left is the Mitchell camera Sven used. During the 1950s, Gunnar Fischer relied on a very old, cumbersome version of the Mitchell, but Sven would soon graduate to the Ariflex, which became his camera of choice throughout the 70s and 80s. Harriet Anderson had not been in a Bergman film since All These Women in 1963. She was always there or thereabouts because she had a contract at the Royal Dramatic Theatre and often appeared under Bergman's direction. She did not feature in any of the films Bergman made during the late 60s, from Persona all the way to The Touch. Then suddenly, working on Cries and Whispers, Bergman wrote this incredibly demanding part for her. She remembered her own father succumbing to cancer in great agony, and she admitted that she called on her memories of that to add credibility to her performance as Agnes. Bergman was fascinated by death more than almost any director. 
In early childhood, he'd witnessed dead bodies being transported to the morgue at the hospital where his father was chaplain. Through his friendship with the hospital caretaker, the young and impressionable Ingmar could see corpses in various stages of decay. The bedroom in Cries and Whispers is the equivalent of death's waiting room, to which Henrik's aunt refers to in Summer Interlude. Although Sven Ligfist was overwhelmingly responsible for the cinematography, you can see that Bergman himself took a very, very keen interest in the framing all the more so because this was a film that would live or die by its close-ups. There was a kind of rapport between him and Sven that went almost beyond words. They just knew what each of them wanted. One of the problems of not shooting in the studio is that lights had to be erected outside as well as inside the manor house, on scaffolding, in order to get the right light through the window. There is, in fact, one particular scene in the film when Harriet Anderson awakens and the light changes through the windows as though the sun were emerging to bless her at one point, all from this huge arc light and the scrims used to adjust the quality of the light. Because those changes in lighting reflect, as it were, the extremes of mood in the film, which veer from anger to reconciliation. Here are the four women, this time wearing white. Much more cheerful. A lot of joking, as happened on every Bergman set. The irony is that he made films that were regarded as profoundly pessimistic and harrowing, and yet on the set there was always a great time to be had. Bergman put something of his mother Karin into each of the four women, and the figure of their mother, played by Lee Woolman in a flashback, actually looks like Karin Bergman, who had died in 1966. Here's B.B. Anderson, by the way, visiting the set. There are no trailers for the stars in Sweden. Everyone's on the same level as everyone else. A year or two after Cries and Whispers was made, I was visiting the Film Institute studios and watched a film called Metamorphosis being made. The lead was played by an amiable actor called Ernst Gunther, and when I left the building later that day, I found him lining up for the same public bus as I was. No stars here, he said ruefully. We're just players. This is Lynn Ullmann, the daughter of Liv and Ingmar. Lynn Ullmann, who would grow up to become a very successful novelist in Norway, and film essayist, incidentally. She came to Cannes in 1997 when the festival, on its 50th anniversary, awarded Bergman with the supreme accolade of the Palm of Palms. She accepted the prize on his behalf, and she would remain close to both her parents. Six years after Cries and Whispers, Lynn appeared as the young Ava in the memories of Lee Woolman's childhood in Autumn Sonata. Bergman liked cookies, and they often served for his lunch with a glass of milk on the side. He's obviously joking with Sven Nikvist about this plate of cookies. There's always a bit of fun going on on a Bergman set. The whole crew breaking into spontaneous high jinks while waiting around. Ingrid Tulin, and on the left, Georg Orlin, by then a veteran of film and TV going back to the World War II period. He'd featured in Bergman's famous 1963 version of Strindberg's A Dream Play. Here he plays Ingrid Tulin's cold fish of a husband. Now the most poetic scene in Cries and Whispers is right at the end, when we see the three sisters and Maria in the swing. It's a passage from Agnes's diary, and serves as the embodiment of loving-kindness, which throughout the film works in opposition to the bitterness and pessimism of the drama. That swing had to be just right, and the crew had to find exactly the right place in the park to put it up. Bergman and Sven Liekvist are wandering through the leaves together, chatting about the next scene. In fact, they made excellent use of this fall weather, because the leaves were turning to a kind of russet gold, and Bergman had his crew sweep the leaves together in profusion 
to add to the chromatic effect. The sense of space and the images of nature shedding its leaves for winter, for death, offer release from the formal, constrained style of the interior sequences. The natural light of the outdoors is in contrast with the harsh, even violent content of scenes like Karin's mutilation of herself or the attempted suicide by Maria's husband. So here comes Bergman with the three ladies, along with Marek Voss and with Greta Johansson, who designed the costumes. She had a keen eye for period apparel and also did the costumes for the magician, incidentally. Here they are at the swing. As usual, the film was being shot out of sequence, which meant, of course, that Harriet Anderson had to play a corpse before she could enjoy this alfresco interlude with her sisters. They wanted to shoot this sequence quite early on, because the weather in Sweden becomes very dark early in the autumn, from around late August, early September onwards. Bergman was a fanatic for light. He loved studio light, but he also loved natural light when he could get it, as did Sven Nyqvist. Paradoxically, some of the best instances of natural light in Bergman's work are in black and white. The unadorned scenes on the island in Summer with Monica, or the opening minutes of Through a Glass Darkly, as the four relatives emerge from the sea. And in The Passion of Anna, Bergman uses natural light to make the colourful woodland where someone's been slaughtering sheep into a sinister, isolated region. Here comes Harriet with her parasol. And one by one, the others follow her. Here it appears that Sven is using a more portable, lightweight camera for the outdoor scenes, and that the weather was indeed pretty grey. This explains why they have those additional lights trained on the swing. It's clear that the crew was small, in line with the budget, on this and almost all Bergman's films. The budget on Cries and Whispers was one and a half million Swedish crowns at the time, around 320,000 US dollars. Some years later, Bergman was asked just how much money he'd earned from Cries and Whispers, to which he responded with a laugh, All I know is that it was like playing a one-armed bandit. You put a coin in the slot, the wheels started spinning, and suddenly three oranges lined up in front of you. Money just gushed out of the machine. Here's a funny shot of Sven dashing up to double-check something with his camera. Bergman was never the kind of director that keeps the cast and crew on duty, filming take after take, until the late evening. Work started punctually in the morning and would generally finish by 5 or 6 p.m. On Wild Strawberries, Victor Sjöström insisted on having his glass of whiskey by 5, and Bergman approved. The tea and coffee break was sacrosanct too, and a chance for everyone to relax after a period of sustained concentration. Now, inside, everybody's having some food, one of the few truly democratic aspects of filming on location. But it's in the midst of a different scene, obviously, as we can see from the black costumes. And note the poster there for Bergman's most recent film at the time, The Touch. This man, with the blonde hair and glasses, is Lars Olaf Lertfall, a journalist who kept a very useful diary of the shoot of Cries and Whispers and helped me a great deal with my research where Swedish films were concerned in the 70s and 80s. This is an intriguing scene, using a lot of low light with candles, where Liv Ullmann has a tete-a-tete -tete with Erland Josefsson as the family doctor. It's clear that the two characters have had a fling in the past. There he is, pacing in the background, Erland Josefsson, who'd been a close friend of Bergman's from the late 1930s onwards. He'd been in several of Ingmar's films, but he really only became a big name in Scandinavia after scenes from a marriage made 12 months later. And Bergman found in his personality something of the doctor. He played one in The Magician, and he played one in Bergman's staging of Hjalmar Bergman's The Legend at the Royal Dramatic Theatre in Stockholm. Erland said afterwards that cries and whispers sparked in him a more intimate approach to screen acting, which he'd never enjoyed all that much previously. 
Here's an anti-smoking poster the crew have created, with Bergman clutching a pack of cigarettes. In fact, he gave up smoking decades before that, although in the late 40s and early 50s he would sit around with actors like Gunnar Björnstrand and Stig Olin and smoke regular cigarettes. He became very abstemious, virtually giving up drinking too. Although when he came to the National Film Theatre in London in 1982, I persuaded him to have a beer. He then ordered a second, and his wife said to me that she hadn't seen that for many years. His abstinence undoubtedly helped him to maintain such a rigorous and productive schedule. So now another take of the death scene. There was this complicity between Bergman and his actors, which came in part, where the women were concerned, from relationships that he'd had with them. But also with the men, a relationship based on joking and a common relish for the process of filmmaking, and of course, theatre production too. There's an interesting story about Sven Nyqvist. When he was shooting Cries and Whispers, he promised Bergman not to use a zoom lens. He said in an interview with American Cinematographer magazine, quote, I suggested we bring just one to help us find out which fixed focal length lens we should have in each situation. But of course I found this was a wonderful toy. My left hand would come up and I would start to change the focal length on the zoom and after a while I found I was neglecting to tell Ingmar I was using the zoom lens. I found that if I zoomed during camera movements and in the same rhythm as the camera movements, then it really didn't show up very obviously. And then Ingmar said, It's strange, I can't remember that we were tracking at all. Although Bergman could resort to a handheld camera when he felt it suited the context, for example, the confusion of a kind of civil war in shame, he more often than not preferred the camera to remain static. Lee Woolman having her hair prepared, rooting around in her basket, taking a phone call, there are moments when she glances into the mirror here when she looks remarkably like B.B. Anderson, and it reminds one of the famous shot in Persona where the halves of their faces were joined together into one face. While they didn't look that much alike when you met them, in shots like that you realise that they can be confused. This is Siv Lundgren the editor of the film. She had been billed as Sieve Kanalv, her maiden name, and she'd begun working with Bergman earlier on The Ritual, a TV movie, and also on his documentary on the island of Fura. She would edit all his films up to and including Face to Face in 1976, after which Bergman had to leave Sweden when he was accused, wrongly, of tax fraud. Then she ceased editing and went back to private life. Bergman is showing Kari Silwan, who has her back to us with Bergman's arm around her, and Ingrid Tulin, how to lay out the corpse of Harriet Anderson. Bergman has often said that the secret of filmmaking is rehearsal, rehearsal, rehearsal. He did a great deal of rehearsing on set like this, and while time was of the essence, it was never of the essence as it is in Hollywood, where every minute is costing thousands of dollars. Here he himself is attending to every detail. Showing them how to cover her legs, draw up the covers, and so on. There's something very sensitive about Bergman's direction of actors, which we can see in this footage. He was very gentle with his actors, and all the more so the older he became and he would spend time with them. And he never forgot to check himself each shot through the viewfinder, even though Sven had lined it up so well.
This is Uwe Svensson, the sound engineer, who would become famous for his work with Berkman. He'd only just become a fully-fledged sound engineer when Cries and Whispers began, and he would go on to record nearly all Bergman's films, including Autumn Sonata, Fanny Alexander, After the Rehearsal, and so on. The sound is precisely calibrated in Cries and Whispers, starting with the inexorable ticking of a variety of clocks throughout the house and extending to the rustling of long dresses as the women hasten through the corridors. Here Cecilia Drott and Britt Falcomo are making up Harriet for her next scene. Ingrid Tulin made a powerful impact in this film. She was one of those actresses, in fact, whom Bergman used almost throughout his career. During the 50s, she'd been absolutely crucial to Bergman's work in films like Wild Strawberries and The Magician, and then in the 60s she featured most memorably in The Silence and Hour of the Wolf. She was in The Ritual, the film he made for TV at the end of the 60s, and she would go on to appear in After the Rehearsal. She was never quite so much in the spotlight as Lee Ullmann and B.B. Anderson, but she made a more successful career outside Sweden, artistically speaking, than almost any other Bergman actor. Think of her performances in René's The War Is Over or in Visconti's The Damned. She was a very discreet woman who was married to Harry Schein, the founder of the Swedish Film Institute, and she became a director in her own right with a couple of very good films, actually. Ingrid Tulin once said, We worked lightly, even in the heaviest parts, with Ingmar Bergman. Certainly the role of Karin verges on the schizophrenic. Now a spectacular, unplanned moment as one of the lights blows outside the manor and everyone starts lighting candles. Presumably the main electricity supply had been overloaded by those huge arc lights. But Bergman liked using candlelight in certain scenes, and this was five years before Kubrick caused such a stir with the candlelit interiors in Barry Lyndon. Now people are gathering for the flashback to the sisters' childhood. It's a magic lantern show, always dear to Bergman's heart, and according to the screenplay, was held every year on Twelfth Night. Inga Gill, seen laughing, is the storyteller. You may remember her as the lusty wench who seduces Scat in The Seventh Seal. This is Lee Ullmann when she is playing the mother, with markedly dark hair reminiscent of Bergman's own mother, Karin Orkeblom. On the right there is Ingrid von Rosen, who would become Ingmar's fifth wife in November 1971, just a month or so after shooting concluded on Cries and Whispers. Ingmar was not only in love with her during the shoot, but also happy and relieved because her protracted divorce from Count Jan Karl von Rosen had been successfully concluded. She really helped to get Ingmar's business affairs onto an even keel, replying to the numerous letters he received, making the arrangements for travel inside and outside Sweden, and so on. Ingrid remained his wife until her untimely death in 1995, suffering from the same kind of cancer as Agnes did in this film. In 2004, it transpired that Ingmar and Ingrid had secretly had a daughter together back in 1959. Maria von Rosen published in tandem with her natural father, Ingmar Bergman, a diary describing the final months of her mother's death. Once again, everybody's having a great deal of fun preparing for this scene, and Bergman always sought to encourage that. He always tried to give parts to his former wives and lovers, to his children, to his relatives, nieces, nephews, and so on. Here is Lena Bergman, the director's eldest daughter.
These shots show office life at Cinematograph, where Bergman maintained a small but loyal staff, including production manager Lars Ove Kalbe. Bergman started keeping this kind of behind-the-scenes footage very early in his career, giving us an invaluable glimpse of his working methods in films like Sawdust and Tinsel and Wild Strawberries. Only very late in life did he agree for the footage to be released. Michael Winterbottom was the pioneer in this regard, persuading Bergman to let him use portions of such footage in his 1989 documentary on Bergman for Thames Television. I'm pretty certain that the man on the left is Bergman's production manager, Lars Ove Kahlberg. But I think it's more interesting to note the way that Bergman listens to people. He was a listener, and everyone I spoke to who worked with him told me that when he was one-on-one -on -one with you, it was as though you were both inside this soap bubble, and he gave you his undivided attention. There was nothing arrogant about Bergman. You felt that he regarded himself as a primus inter pares, as the Vikings used to say, on a par with his working colleagues. He had no pretensions. You can see that also in the way he dresses. Very utilitarian clothes, nothing flashy, just what it takes to do the work at hand. In fact, he was never much interested in his appearance and felt awkward when having to dress up for formal occasions. Dee Woolman in the role of the mother. The spirit and multifaceted character of Ingmar's mother haunts numerous sequences in Cries and Whispers. The Sunday evening gatherings with stories read aloud, the formal rigidity of the dining table reflecting Karin Bergman's stern bourgeois upbringing, the arm neutrality between husband and wife, the repressed passion in Lee Woolman's Maria, the uncompromising bitterness of Ingrid Tulin's Karin, and the tenderness inherent in Harriet Anderson's interpretation of Agnes. For the first time, we see Katinka Farrago on the right, who was Bergman's faithful script assistant, rather as Terio Nagami was for Kurosawa, over 50 years and more. Katinka's first film for Bergman as a teenager was Dreams, actually made as far back as 1954, although she was uncredited. And so the shoot is almost over. This inscription in Bergman's handwriting reads, It's really been a wonderfully stimulating experience for all of us to work in this fine old house with its atmosphere of Swedish manorial life. Signed, Ingmar Bergman, October 28, 1971. Sven Nyqvist, munching an apple. 52 days after shooting the first scene, his work is done, and finally he can relax. Sven would win an Academy Award for his cinematography on Cries and Whispers, and the film itself would earn a further four nominations. <laughs>